Okay, so we concluded last time with the announcement of the angel to Joseph uh, that Mary was um, that Mary was with child through the Holy Spirit, and then. Uh, we talked about the naming of Jesus. She will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So that leads us then to verses 22 through 23. Uh, welcome, Jessica, uh, to class. So we're going to go there. Does somebody want to read 22 and 23? Go ahead, Mary. Well, this happened because Mary was the mother of God. Look, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. Okay, so the first question in your notes is, how does this verse prove verbal inspiration? How does it prove ver ver you know what verbal inspiration is, first of all? Uh, the, the speaking of the Lord, right, through the scriptures. How does it prove it? Okay, how does it specifically say it was foretold, though, in the verse that proves, what's that? The prophet said it, but who spoke it? Actually, the Lord through the prophet, right? So there's verbal inspiration, right? God is speaking through the prophet. So that shows that Isaiah is actually inspired by whole verbal inspiration is spoken by the Lord. Sue? Right. Mm -hmm. That he was in the line of Jesus? Oh. Sue is asking if Joseph would have known the prophecy through Isaiah, I guess. Yeah. We don't we don't know for sure, but it was yeah, it, it was in the Bible, but they didn't have as easy access to the Bible as we do, obviously. They would have heard it at the at the uh, temple and things like that. So I'm not sure how regularly that was read. Uh, Jesus opened up to it when he taught in the synagogue. So it's just like anybody, how well do you know the scripture versus another member, I guess, you know. Um, but we have a lot, you know, even those of us who have Bibles on our shelves don't know it as well as we could or we should, right? So... I don't know how common that verse was. Uh, they were looking forward to, there was a lot of Messiah talk back in Joseph's time. So maybe that was part of it. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the prophet is, who's the prophet? I already said who the prophet is. Isaiah, it doesn't specifically say it there, right? Anybody know the actual chapter and verse? No? 7 verse 14. Chapter 7, verse 14. Um, 700 years before Christ, this prophecy was spoken to an unbelieving Isaiah or Ahaz who didn't even want to sign. Remember that he was wanted to tell him that he wasn't going to be defeated. And they said, oh, God will give you a sign in the highest heavens to the lowest. So he could have asked for anything. He could have asked for the sky to turn green or, you know, for God to write his name in the clouds. You know, Ahaz, he could have done anything. And Ahaz in a in typical unbelieving fashion, just said, I don't want to put the Lord, the God to the test. So um, in other words, I don't want to put God through the problem. You know, it's like, here you have a miracle from God and I don't want to put you through the, through the hassle. Um, so he uh, says, well, you're going to get a sign anyway. And he gives him a sign that he would have no clue what it means probably. But uh, 700 years later, here we have the answer to it, that the, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So uh, beautiful text that we use at Christmas time. Uh, so it's nice that we get to study this during Advent to think about how um, the Matthew looks at this prophecy and connects it to Isaiah because remember he's writing this to Jews, right? So, so um, again, Sue, if you ask, did he know this? I would hope that he did. He was a faithful Jewish man. So, um, but but 
If they didn't, Matthew is re referring back to that to his Jewish audience. Now, the word in the Greek for virgin is parthenos. So there are some who say, for instance, the word for, I believe in Hebrew, for, for virgin is alma, which can mean young maiden. So they say, well, the prophecy really wasn't of a virgin birth, but of a young lady having a giving birth, and that's about as as miraculous as nothing, you know, uh, a lot of young women give birth. So the virgin birth, when we look at the Greek Parthenos, we can see that it clearly is referring to a virgin. Uh, for instance, 1 Corinthians 7, 28 says, if you do marry, you haven't sinned. If a virgin marries, she has not sinned, but those who marry will face many troubles there. It means somebody who has not had sexual relations. Um, 2 Corinthians 11 uh, he, he talks about his desire for the Corinthians to stay in the faith, and he has a godly jealousy for them. And I promised you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. That's the same word uh, uh, to be uh, uh, for Parthenus there. Uh, Revelation 14, though, these are those who did not defile themselves with women. They kept themselves pure. Uh, there the word virgin is used and acts 21 he had four unmarried daughters and the word there is parthenos who prophesied so it's not referring to age in those instances but it's referring specifically to um to marriage and sexual status there in those instances so um the miracle birth is not a natural birth but it shows shows how the prophecy got more specific over the years uh, as time went on. What does Emmanuel tell us about the child that's going to, to uh, be born? It's going to be God in the flesh, right? God with us, okay? Emmanuel. Um, so think about how this minimizes uh, the place of where to look for the Messiah. Um, so don't look in the clouds, don't look in power, right? Um, but look in the flesh of a baby, right? This is how your Messiah is going to come. Not, not flying in the clouds like Superman from another planet, uh, but in the flesh of a little baby, okay? Uh, through a birth, actually. So God is not going to come as an alien uh, that way, okay? Um, so those are some things to take note of there. Um, any other co questions, comments on 22 through 23 specifically? Beautiful prophecy fulfilled in Isaiah 7, 14. Anything I missed? Anything you want to add? Online, you guys all good? All right. So verses 24 and 25 are our next ones there. Uh, finishing out chapter one. Anybody online want to try to read? Nobody yet? No? Okay, they're all saying no. All right, somebody here. Uh, go ahead, George, 24 and 25. Okay, so note, first of all, Joseph's immediate obedience. Why, why is that important? Good morning, Pastor. Why is it important uh, that Jesus, that Joseph, uh, Joseph's immediate obedience? Or why, why, why is verse, why, I mean, why, why is verse 25 important? Uh, that doesn't have anything to do with his obedience, but why is the fact that he didn't, he was not intimate with her until she gave birth. Why is that? Why is that part important? Okay, um, that is true. He did believe that. Yeah, he, he's trying to make sure that everybody would know that this is not Joseph's son. It's not his natural son. So he's being, making that very clear through this, so that there's no just question there. Yeah, George. <laughs> Yeah, he asked the question, didn't, didn't uh, Catholicism teach that she 
she remained pure all her life. Um, and that, yeah, that's one of the questions up here. Um, what does this verse insinuate about after the birth of Jesus? So you're kind of... Right, so it says he did not, was not intimate with her until she gave birth to her firstborn. So what is that insinuating? They were sexually active after they were married, right? It doesn't specifically say that. Um, what if they didn't have sexual relations? Right, what kind of a marriage... <laughs> that, that's part of marriage, isn't it? Um, I don't imagine that he would have been too thrilled with that or her either. <laughs> so um, it's part of marriage to have sexual relations, right? You have sexual happiness, children, and um, what's the third one there? Um, three C's, companionship, right? Companionship. So if they wouldn't have that, then she wouldn't even be fulfilling her marital duty as a wife, and he wouldn't be fulfilling it as a husband, according to Paul. So, George. No, the, the, you see this, this next verse here in Matthew 13, um, it says, they asked the question later on, um, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So from that, you might say, well, it says brothers for four. Four guys were his brothers. And then did he have how many children did uh, Mary end up having if they're sisters too? But the word in the Greek for brothers can also mean cousins. So the Catholics would say in that case, um, that they were cousins, they weren't actually blood brothers. So, um, so what about some, sisters? What's that? What about, uh, sis what about sisters? Right. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I don't. I think I guess sisters. They would say that means cousins too. I'm not sure on that one. So, um, but well, that's the way. That's the way we would say it, right? Uh, one other thing that, yeah, I mean, we, I would, we, we, I mean, we don't say it could be cousins. Uh, and one of the things that the Catholics point to is the fact that Jesus hands Mary over to, to John at the cross and not to his brothers. Well, the reason we would say behind that might be because his brothers did not come to faith until after his resurrection. Um, so, you know, there's both sides of the story. We don't need Jesus and Mary to be a perpetual virgin, obviously, with our theology, but they, they do for some reason. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's here nor there, I guess. Right. Doesn't tell us it's not really that important. I would, yeah. So, but I mean, thinking again about the purpose of marriage. It would be important to me if I were Joseph. <laughs> so, yeah, until she gave birth. So the word, the question is until. Does that, does that necessarily say that after she gave birth, she did have sex? Well, they did have sexual relations. It would seem so. But it could be that it, it really, it's an argument from silence because it really doesn't say what happened after. And they may not have, but um, I'm not going to get in an arm wrestling match <laughs> over it. Oh, okay. 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 Sue mentioned that the book of Maccabees, which is part of the Apocrypha, right, that the Catholics refer to as actual scriptures, has a lot of stuff to do with Mary, I guess. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Now I've got to share my next Bible study so, or online here. So we're going to go to the next one. Student. Okay. You guys see that online okay? Yes. Yep, can still hear me okay then too, I assume, right? All right, I'm getting shaking heads, so good. All right. Um, 
So we're going to go to chapter two now. Nice. Uh, now we get to the visit of the wise men. And nice uh, thing in scripture. So I got to put my leader's guide aside here. Okay. So verses one and two of chapter two. Somebody want to read that for me? Carol. All right. You got to unmute yourself. Can you turn your mute off, Carol? All right. Come on. Oh, I can hear After, you now. Okay, you're good. Okay. <laughs> After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. All right. Thank you. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see the little nuanced differences there between the EHB and the NIV. You used Magi. And I did. you said... And it says, we saw his star in the east, and the EHV says, when it rose. Um, otherwise, they're very, I think they're almost the same. So, Magi versus wise men. Yes, Mary. Yeah, December 21st, you're going to see those two stars. Yeah. I think it said if they would be as close as the width of the moon, which isn't right on top of each other, but the next time it'll be happening is in like two, 2080. So probably did be dead by then. So, uh, <laughs> so we better get out and look at it uh, on the 21st, I guess. So right one hour after sunset, the two, yeah, it's the winter solstice for, for one week, it will be pretty, clear like shining in the sky with these two stars or planets that cross each other i guess is it stars or planets planets two planets yeah it wouldn't be stars venus and uh jupiter yeah okay so um why is the location of jesus birth important that it's in bethlehem because it was prophesied you know where that one was prophesied? Anybody got it off the top of your head? Bethlehem Ephrathah, yeah. There's two different Bethlehems, right? But we're in the Bible. Micah, yes. You get extra credit, George. Micah 5, verse 2 specifically is correct. So it's important because God's word predicted that he would be born in Bethlehem. Think about how the origins of Jesus were misunderstood during Jesus' time. What, what was the big bugaboo with a lot of the Jews when it came to Jesus? What was he known as? Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth. right? Nazareth. Yeah. yeah. So they're like, how could anything good come from Nazareth, right? Um, so and then it introduces us to um, Herod, when Herod was king in verse 1, right? And I've got a few uh, cut and pasted things about Herod, uh, known as Herod the First or Herod the Great. He was a Roman client, king of Judea. His surname of the Great is widely disputed because he is described as a madman who murdered his own family and, and a great many rabbis. He is also known for his colossal building projects in Jerusalem and all, elsewhere, including his expansion of the Second Temple in Jerusalem sometimes referred to as Herod's Temple, and the construction of the port at Caesarea Maritima. Um, I got to see uh, that, uh, the ruins of that when I was over in Jerusalem, and also the base for his temple, which was very impressive, the size of those stones. Important details of his biography are gleaned from the works of the first century uh, Roman Jewish historian Josephus, Josephus Flavius. So, um, Albrecht also says that Herod the Great was a descendant of Esau. He wasn't really an Israelite. He was the first of several Herods. He was a clever and capable warrior, orator, and diplomat. He was one of the great builders in the history of the Jews. He was also cruel, merciless, and jealous. He had his wife's brother, Aristobulus the high priest, drowned and then pretended to mourn at the magnificent funeral he provided. He had his own wife, Mariamne, killed, as well as her mother and three of his sons. 
Shortly before his death, he had the most distinguished citizens of Jerusalem in prison and then gave orders that they should be executed at the moment of his own death. And that way he wanted to ensure that there would be mourning in the city at the time of his death. <laughs> For he knew that otherwise there might be only rejoicing among the citizenry. So it's easy to see why Herod was upset upon hearing the news of Jesus, even though he was obviously near the end of his life. He died in 4 BC. He felt threatened by the report of a newborn king. Um, so yes, he was a real piece of work. If you think our politicians are bad, you ain't seen nothing compared to those. Um, so yeah. Uh, well, the timing of Christ is probably off by a few years, actually. So Jesus was probably born around 4 BC, I think they actually say. So um, there was like, a, I think it was a Catholic who actually kind of did that, the whole year thing. I don't know, do you remember what year, Pastor? 200 AD or something, 300 AD, somewhere around there is when that actual calendar, the Gregorian, isn't it the Gregorian calendar? So it's probably in the 300s, maybe 400s. I am terrible with history, but I think that's when that, our, our, if anybody have better memory than me, Pastor is looking it up on Google, so um, it's all going to come together. <laughs> The great theologian Google. So, <laughs> um, notice now I got this little note here. Notice how the word is placed in history. In other words, it gives specific locations and specific rulers, which is it's kind of neat to think about how the Bible is set in history, as opposed to Mormonism that talks about faraway planets and talks about uh, locations in America that have never actually been archaeologically found, okay? The, the Nephites and the whateverites, that they've never found any graveyards, anything according to Mormon history, but this is set in actual history, and so God is God of history. Pastor. Okay, so he said 525 Dionysius. I'm not going to say the rest of his names. And then it was start didn't get widely in use until 800s, the 800s AD. Oh, so the Gregorian calendar he said was in the 1500s cuz Pope Gregory put it in use. All right. There you go. Um, so that's why it's four years off, Mike, because Pope Gregory didn't realize that the Anicius was off by four years. So, all right. Um, now, uh, you have a soccer quote there. Uh, oh, wait, before we get to that. Um, all right, I guess that's it. Um, does mention the Magi there, uh, or the wise men, I guess. It, it, it's a, a magus, that it's the name given by the Babylonians, Medes, Persian, and others, two wise men, teachers, priests, physicians, astrologers, seers, interpreters of dreams, augurs, soothsayers, and sorcerers, okay? Um, the, the oriental wise men, uh, and also another name for a magus, is who discovered by the rising of the star that the Messiah had been born, or a magus could also be in the Greek, a false prophet and a sorcerer. So it depends on context. Usually when it uses magus, it's not good in scripture, but here it seems to put a good, a good connotation on these magus. Um, there is a magus um, in the book of Acts, I think where Paul puts a curse on him and he turns blind, Simon the sorcerer, who is a Simon the magus, okay? So these guys who used arts, uh, you know, kind of dark arts, black arts, I guess you would say, to do their things. But here it's not so bad, I guess you'd say, since he uses them. Yilva Sacher says, according to Herodotus and Pliny, the Magi were a distinguished caste of priests among the Medes and Persians. They were concerned chiefly with astrology, the science of the stars, should say, but also with astronomy and mystic arts, science, incantations, and necromancy. Um, it's talking to the dead, isn't it? 
So it's very probable that Balaam, the son of Beor, whom Balak summoned from Pithor by the river Euphrates to curse Israel, was of the order of the Magi. In the book of Daniel, the Magi are often termed Chaldees, or the wise men of Babylon. Daniel was made chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. But this fact would not indicate that Daniel himself practiced sorcery, as many of the heathen Magi were entirely unable to perform witchcraft or exorcism. In Persian inscriptions, the priests are called Magush, Magi. The wise men of our text were occupied apparently with astronomy, possibly also with astrology. A tradition in the Catholic Church declares that they were kings um, because of their gifts and a misconception of a passage like Isaiah 60, verse 3. The tradition is not supported by the records of history. So um, I can, yeah, we three kings of Orient are, might not be completely biblical. Um, Isaiah 60 talks about uh, nations will walk to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And then it mentions later on that caravans of camels will cover your land. Young camels from Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba will come. They will carry gold and incense and they will go the good news of the praise of the Lord. So that seems to have some indications of the wise men coming. We usually have pictures of them on camels and things like that. Um, but that could be symbolic of kings who would be brought to faith too. Um, so um, different passages there about these wise men, who they were exactly and what they were. Um, not for sure on that, uh, but I like that prophecy in Isaiah nonetheless, and I can see why they associated them with kings, although they may have represented kings too. So Isaiah 72 um, is another, uh, maybe a, pa a passage that's similar to Isaiah 60, Psalm 72, I mean. Somebody want to read that, verses 8 through 11 for me? Kathy, go ahead. Tarshish. So, um, Sheba and Seba, if I remember right, is down by the Red Sea more, down to the south. Um, and the wise men are thought to have come more from the, the, the Babylon area, okay? Um, so, it's speculated that... Um, that they came from Daniel because Daniel was sent to Babylon and then maybe Daniel brought the prophecies with him and then there's somehow it was associated with the star through Daniel who brought the word of God to the wise men. If he was part of the wise men, then that word would have been traveled on through the centuries and then that's what brought them. So more from Babylon than from Sheba and Seba. Mary. Are you talking like China and stuff like that? In the Yapu, it was interesting when we went to this women's retreat. This girl who teaches at MLC, uh -huh. who teaches Chinese, uh -huh. she showed all the things in the Chinese language. I have heard about that. That have to do with it, and that stuff about the prophecies of the of a Messiah is part of that. Huh. And so that's why some people say, well, they were from the Orient that came. You know, they came we three kings of Orient are. So she was so saying that's that. Where that they can't have come from that idea mm -hmm. that Could you guys hear what she was saying online at all? No, she, there was a, a presenter in a women's rally from China, I guess, and she talked oh. about the Chinese language and, and the language, right? How there was prophecies from within China and the Chinese language about a Messiah. And so she associated that that prophecy with maybe having come from actually the Orient, these guys. So. And then also in that, they showed in the Quran and stuff of the early language, they had things about the creation mm -hmm. and the promise and all that. Okay. Stuff. It was just really interesting that it goes, they said, 
that you can find it in almost any language, but they were amazed at how much it didn't make Chinese language. So the Chinese language has a lot of pictures of the star and everything else in it. I wish, I wish I could have seen that presentation. It sounds interesting. I have heard though that within the symbols of the Chinese language, there is Christian symbols and stuff like that. So kind of a neat thing to think about. So what drew them to Jerusalem, obviously, from uh, uh, the verses that we read? The star, right? Um, um, Well, they would have been Gentiles, but uh, I would assume that from what they say, go worship him. So they would have been somehow believers of, of well, the king of the Jews. Why would they come and worship him unless there was messianic prophecies associated with that? So I would say they were somehow believers. George? Um, it's interesting that he doesn't get into the census the reason that they went to that well not the wise men though oh no. well, why matthew doesn't mention yeah. the census yeah. well they didn't like taxes the jews hated taxes right <laughs> so the gentile you'd say the gentile gospel uh kind of written more towards greeks that's the one that mentions that so yeah they probably would have been pretty put off by that idea that tax would bring them to, to Bethlehem. Yeah. But it is covered in the other gospel. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point though. Um, why would they associate this appearance of a star with the birth of the king of the Jews? Foretold somehow, right? Um, interesting video. Did you guys ever see that? The star of Bethlehem. It talks about um, when the two constellations meet, and that might be the one this year we're talking about, um, that the Vir Virgo, uh, at the birth of Christ, Virgo would have had the sun in her armpit and the moon at her feet, and Jupiter, the king planet, Virgo is for the virgin, Jupiter, the king planet, and Venus, mother planet, come together. So Jupiter and Venus come together, and so no one alive ever saw a star that bright. And, and when this, in the video, they say that at the timing this would have happened would have been right at the birth of Christ. Now the People's Bible rejects that theory, but it was still a neat video. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know how much truth there is, but for those who study the stars a lot and the constellations, they, they, I think they said that it would have come together, would have come apart, and then would have come together again, just like in the prophecy. So... I don't know. It was, it was kind of interesting, but you know, take it for what it's worth. Uh, it was a it was a neat video. I'll give it that. So, <laughs> um, it was yeah. According to my notes here, uh, Jupiter and Venus is what this one says. So, oh, it is okay. All right. So, here we go. Uh, that's probably it then. So December 21st, you can relive the original Christmas. Yeah, it's true. It's too cloudy here. So, yeah, yeah. Second coming. We're ready, aren't we? Absolutely. Now, the, the, the passage that we would refer to if they were looking for a star, that we're maybe looking for a star prophecy would be Numbers 24, verse 17. Somebody want to read that one uh, for me? It's in your notes. Numbers 24, 17. Uh, Mike, go ahead. I see him, but not now. The moment, but not near. The star of the mother of David, the shepherd, the right of Israel, who is present before him, of Moab, the spoke of all the sons of the so some have looked at that as a prophecy of the star, but the star is actually Jesus. So not quite the same, although, you know, some say the star would be pointing to Jesus, but here in the picture language, he actually is the, the star. So um, what did their statement reveal? This is what we talked about already. If you look at um, verse two, what did it reveal about who they believe the child to be? The king of the Jews, right? But also what did they say they came to do? worship him. So 
he also would have to be God if they said we've come to worship him, right? So God in the flesh is what they believed somehow in some way that this king of the Jews is not only for the Jews, but for the world, okay? So what does this tell us about the realms of conversion? The realms of conversion, what do I mean by that question? It's all over the world. So if God could bring these magi from hundreds of miles away and reveal to them that the king of the Jews has been born and they come to worship him, that God can definitely work some miraculous things if you think about it, that he could bring somebody to faith and to, to come that far. So this is, this is sometimes known as the Gentile Christmas, the epiphany, the showing of the star Epiphano to shine out is saying that God didn't just come for the Jews, but he came for the Gentiles as well. And here we are hundreds of miles away, worshiping the same Jesus who's the king of the world, the king of the Jews, the king of the savior. So what a wonderful thing that God could work through these guys, maybe through a prophecy of Daniel that went there, was imprisoned, and God brought them to faith as he brings them into the Magi. I don't know, but somehow in some way, and God also used uh, the stars to draw them there. So he uses nature in this case, attaches a promise to it, and they come. So kind of a neat thing. Um, all right, that's uh, one and two. Any questions or extra comments on verses one and two? Good. All right, verses three through six. I'll give my online listeners. Anybody want to read that for me? Deb, you want to read? Okay. Yeah. Let me get it situated. Right. Um, when the king, when King Herod heard this, he was alarmed, and all Jerusalem with him. He gathered together all the people's chief priests and experts in the law. How far am I reading? Through verse six. Okay. He asked them where the Christ was born, was to be born. They said to him, "In Bethlehem of Judea, because this was written through the prophets." You, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are certainly not least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. All right. Thank you. Well done. So why would, now we can understand why Herod was disturbed, but why would Jerusalem be disturbed with Herod? Pastor? Yes. Nancy? Um, I think because of his reputation of any time he didn't like something, people were murdered and um, yeah. it would just cause great unrest. Right. If Herod ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> I think I've heard a term something like that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they knew if he's not, if he's upset, something's going to happen here, right? Herod's question reveals that. Um, it's interesting, he calls himself the king of the Jews, um, but he didn't even know where the Christ was to be born, right? Um, he is clueless about the scriptures, okay, in a sense. He didn't know that Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem means, anybody know? They're Hebrew or been taught it over the years? No? At House of Bread? What's that? House, house of bread? That's correct. Beit Lechem, house of bread. And isn't that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said that was Herod's form of Google. Yeah, um, bringing in all those who knew the scriptures. Um, John 6, you know, you think about that house of bread and think about Jesus being born in the house of bread. Here's our loaf of bread that we can eat. Uh, from for life he says in John 6 I tell you the truth it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven but it's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world sir they said from now on give us this bread then Jesus declared I am the bread of life he who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty so isn't it a neat thing then that we eat of him in the, in the bread of unleavened bread of the Lord's Supper as well to receive the bread of life. And here Jesus is born as our Beit Lechem, our house of bread, where the bread is born. So kind of a neat thing that that's where Jesus is born. 
Yovasacher says Bethlehem is so insignificant that its inhabitants did not even constitute an independent aleph or division with it, with a special chieftain in in among the Hebrews. So there might have been it's speculated, you know, how many were in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. I saw one speculation of about two thousand people, if, if even that. That might even be high. Um, George. On our trip to Israel, that was, that was one of my biggest disappointments. Bethlehem? Being a little town in Bethlehem. Yeah? Was, I mean, just not. It was, it was stinky and dirty. Well, it's part, we of, it's part of Palestine, isn't right. it? Yeah. And we got off the bus and it smelled. Oh. <laughs> into, I mean, once we got into the courtyard and everything. Mm -hmm. Church, yeah, but then that was so ornate, and yeah, we had to go down in here. Yeah, that all you know, all those shrines, all yeah, they're talking about the shrines that were built around the, the supposed uh, birthplace of Jesus, and you got to cl climb down, and they have. The Eastern Orthodox Church, and there's another church connected to another church, and, and then yeah, probably. And you got to crawl down and you go in this little hole and there's a little star in the, on the floor with this little candle thing or whatever. But it, what, for me, what was neat, I didn't remember the smell being that bad. Maybe they cleaned things up when I got there. But uh, when you went, I don't know if they took you on a, on a trip outside of town and then you could see like a typical place where a shepherd would, would be watching his sheep and things like that. And I had a nice overview of the valley in between Bethlehem and Israel. And you could see how close it is, first of all. But then it was a beautiful countryside, and that's kind of envisioned to me, you know, a nice picture of where Jesus would have been born. Thank you, Karen. I think it was just a Catholic Jewish Orthodox Church. Yeah. 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 Ye
Sorry, I forgot. Um, all right, thanks. Let's go on then. Do anybody else have any comments on three to six at all? Okay. Uh, let's go to seven and eight. Uh, somebody want to read that for me? Nancy, we can hear you loud and clear. You want to read those for us? Seven and eight, do you have your Bible handy there? Yes. All right. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Okay. So notice that Herod specifically wanted to know time and location, right? Time and location. Uh, so uh, he wanted to know ex exactly when the star appeared, and then he sent them to Bethlehem and tell me where it is. What was uh, Herod's form of worship going to be? Yeah, murder, child sacrifice, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I will take this child and throw it on the throw it on the fire to my own self service, right? So that's how I'm going to worship him. It was a Canaanite type of worship uh, where you kill the children. Um, how might um, you see laziness in Herod and a lack of faith in the spiritual leaders? Right, these guys have come hundreds of miles, and it's only five miles away. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of surprising, in a sense, that he didn't say, oh, I'll come along with you, you know, and they didn't know that Herod was this butcher, I guess. Um, just laziness or what? Uh, so, but even the spiritual leaders, these guys come from hundreds of miles away, but they think these guys are just a bunch of kooks, probably. We're not going to go with them. And uh, they don't even follow Mary. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's interesting too. I just Pastor borrowed me one of his commentaries, and I'd never read this before, but. Uh, I guess according to, to Jewish folk, folklore, um, I don't know if it's uh, Josephus or Herodotus, I don't remember who wrote about it, but said that according to their folklore that one of the reasons why the Jews were told to throw their children into the river because there was a prophecy they said about one of the Jewish children that was going to humble them and, and bring the Israelites to freedom. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it's kind of interesting to think about why they originally killed the children in, in, in Egypt. And you see pictures, I guess, a lot of people like to see pictures of what happened to the Jews. And then they see pictures of what happened to Moses with what happened to Jesus. Okay, so I, I'm not saying that's for sure true or anything, but uh, you do see some pictures with Old Testament history with what Jesus is that okay, Pastor? Am I wouldn't be thrown under the seminary bus for saying that? Or? All right, okay. Um, they would probably raise their eyebrows about it, though, obviously, right? So, um, so, but you gave me the commentary, so it's your fault. Um, so, uh, so, any other uh, comments on Herod? Obviously, secretly summoned the wise men, so he's being shifty about it. Anything else there? Okay, 9 through 12, 9 through 12. Anybody want to read that? George Houseman, you want to read that for me? Um, after listening to, the rain, listening to the king, they went on their way. The star that they had seen when it rose and went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with overwhelming joy. Through 12. Through 12. After they went into the house, and saw the child with Mary's mother, they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Since they had been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. Okay. So what does this tell us about the nature of the star? Yeah, very bright. Very accurate. Yeah, I mean... How could a star's light go right over a house? 
that's got to be miraculous, right? I mean, somehow it must have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, yeah. So the yeah. So um, you know, it also must have disappeared for a time, right? Because they stop, and it says that, right? And they have to go and find out where where exactly it was. So it gets them in the general vicinity. They go talk to Herod. And then they, they, they appears again, and they're and they're so that's where some the guy with the, the constellation thing said it came together, but then it came back together, and that's how it reappeared. That was what the theory was there. Um, Pastor. Yes. Um, and it says house, so they weren't in the manger. Right, right, and that was my next point. I'm coming to the house. This shows that the child would have been older by this time. Uh, the word in the Greek is pideon, and it can be used for toddlers or infants. It's not specific to infants. So the manger scenes are wrong. Hate the burst your bubble. Uh, but uh, this would have been a little bit later up upon the, so really if we do the manger scene, we should put the, the, the wise men a little bit further off. Um, but I think we all understand that too. That's, it's just a picture. So, um, but yeah, so again, think about the, the fact that they still, they still worshiped him though. Uh, it's still an amazing thing to me to think about, to see these two run of the mill people in a regular house. And there's this little toddler and you actually bow down and worship this little kid, this little toddler, you know, maybe one years old and you're worshiping this child. That's an amazing thing to me to think about that um, travel hunt. and it doesn't say anything about them being disappointed you know there's no there's no they're not disappointed by the fact that he's not in a palace that he doesn't have all these guards around him that the Jews don't even know that he's their king and here they come and they still worship him and they give him their gifts and uh, they don't let any of that get in the way. You know, you think about preconceived notions about who your kid, this king is going to be. They don't let any of that get in the way, and they go and they worship him. So there's got to be some faith there. Well, I would hope that these guys weren't. <laughs> uh, hopefully, they, yeah, she mentioned that their view of stars and astrology, and uh, hopefully they weren't these multi-believers in many gods type of thing. It doesn't really say it, though. So. Do we know why? Wait, wait, just wait a sec. Go ahead, Mike. He wasn't there. So the Holy Spirit had to reveal it to Matthew and what happened. Yep, absolutely. What were you going to say online? Um, do we know why um, Joseph and Mary stayed in Bethlehem? They had gone there because of the decree of yep. Caesar Augustus. Why did they linger? Well, I would suppose that maybe um, maybe they didn't have money to go back. Uh, maybe Joseph, you know, Joseph was from there originally, so maybe uh, he found family there, and they they kind of liked it there, you know. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it seemed like they probably planned on living there and, and getting settled there. So, yeah, maybe he found some good uh, carpentry business around there, and it picked up, you know. So. <laughs> Okay. If you Thank think you. about how a private business works, you know, you get your clientele and word of mouth goes around and hey, we're okay here. So. Okay. Thank you. And maybe too, I don't know, this is speculation, but maybe um, Mary and Joseph didn't have the greatest reputation up north with the way things went down. We, we talked about that a little bit in the last class too. Mm -hmm. Uh, when he was underneath two years old, yes. Yeah, so however old he is at this coming, that's when he's got to flee. So right. they don't get settled too long, right? Yeah, Mary? God, God wanted him there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It was not anything that was little. Mm -hmm. he, it was a huge uh, That's an interesting thing. Sue mentioned like the shepherds coming in the night he was born and everything, and then and yet Jerusalem has no clue about it either, which is kind of a sad thing. You know, you 
how many people then in Bethlehem, how did they respond? That's all. Yeah, it's just across the valley. Yeah. But again, you think about, I don't know, maybe the, the Jerusalem thought of themselves as the, hoi, you know, the, the, the creme de la creme, and then Bethlehem is like the Kakal in a Bay City or something. <laughs> I'm kidding. I was just there in Kakal last, last night, so they're all good. Um, so, uh, but anyway, um, very nice town, Kakal. Um, um, so let's just go through those gifts real quick, and then we can be done for the day. Um, gold suggests what, perhaps? Money. R some say royalty with the gold. Yeah, um, that's the most precious metal. It never rusts, I guess. Gold doesn't rust. Pure gold doesn't. Christ is king, maybe that represents. Incense is connected to worship at the temple. So you might think of Christ as deity. Yeah. Myrrh was an aromatic resin used in the embalming process and also was offered to Jesus uh, in the wine at the cross. So it might be a reference to Jesus suffering. Okay. Um, so that might be some of the meaning behind that. It's speculation. Uh, but, you know, you think of him as king, God, and the suffering king. Note the usage of dreams again in the story that they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. They went back to their own country by another route. So we hear a lot of that in this Christmas story about, um, wasn't it Joseph who saw the angel in a dream, right? Mary had a vision, I think, but Joseph had a dream and these guys have a dream. And maybe, again, God's speaking to people through dreams and visions. In, in the last days, in Acts, he says, your young men will see dreams and and, and see visions, and this is how God communicated with the people here in the last days. So um, that gets us to uh, the flight to Egypt, but we'll save that to last. To next time, are there any questions before we quit at all? George? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, right on the Brady on the wall, yep. And before that, he had, was was it the, he interpreted the dream for of um, Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah, the dream. Of, yeah, with the tree, mm -hmm. um, and you know Joseph with the with the interpretation of the dreams, and uh, so it's an interesting thing that you connect that to Daniel because if these wise men were from Daniel's time, they would have put a great importance on dreams. So if he communicated with them once like that, maybe he did prior to, to bring them there in the first place. Neat things to talk about or think about. So, yeah, good. Um, let's, uh, let's close with that for next time. Let's pray. Let's close with prayer. Um, dear Lord, we thank you for drawing the wise men uh, to see Jesus and worship him. And we thank you for drawing us to your word and to, your, to our Savior, Jesus, as well. As we prepare to celebrate Christmas, open our eyes and put us to our knees and, and great thanks for the wonderful gift you give us in, in Christ crucified, God made flesh, Emmanuel, who came to live and die for us. Uh, bless us today and always in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for coming.